was down in the valley before love came and grabbed me. Good morning, everyone. Whose idea was to have coffee before church? Trying to get everyone to, to positions. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Do come and grab your seats. If you're outside and you're on your coffee, please grab whoever you're speaking to. Bring them through. We'll start in just a moment. Uh, but for now, let's play our introduction video. Hopefully, we're getting trained by the sound of the music to go find our seats. Uh, thank you, Aaron and team. And we'll start in just a moment. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Freedom Church. Welcome to another Sunday here at uh, Freedom Church. My name is Sim, and I'm going to lead us through this morning. Today is, anyone know? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Show us your palms, everyone. There we go. Palm Sunday, not that sort of palm. Uh, parents, you can explain that joke to your children. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, and um, I just want to read to us from Mark chapter 11. This is the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and I know some of you have been out there, and this is an incredible moment. You stand on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus walked, uh, came over the hillside from a place called Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives, and would have come down a really steep incline into Jerusalem. You can see Jerusalem in front of you as you come down this really steep road, the road that Jesus would have taken. But let me just read to you from Mark chapter 11. It says this, As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. He said, go to that village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden before. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. Can I just say, don't do this at home. Don't go to your neighbor's car and just say, the Lord needs it and he will return it soon. I think this is a one-off event. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied it outside, tying outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, threw garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around were shouting, Praise God! Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessing on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heavens. Jerusalem was packed with people. It was the time of festivals. There had been hundreds of thousands of people. And this was some way they would celebrate a king by lying in the streets. And they would put their cloaks on the floor. And they would cut down local branches, palm branches, and lay them out as like a carpet, like a red carpet. And saying, we're celebrating you. We're welcoming you because we believe you're the Messiah, the one that's going to save us, rescuing us. And so this morning, someone said to me, have we got our palm crosses here this morning? And I said, we haven't got, you know, those little palm crosses you can buy from the bookshop for 100, for 20 quid or something. And we hand them all out. We could do that. And I said, but it's not very cultural. We don't really walk around in our day and age in in Romsey and cut branches off trees. We might get into trouble and put our cloaks on the floor to celebrate a VIP coming into the town. Do we? We do something different. When royalty appears or when a VIP appears, what do we do? We do a standing ovation. We celebrate people by saying, you are really important. You are special. In a minute, we're going to do a standing ovation to welcome the King of Kings. You see, in the time of Jesus, that was the way they did it. They would use branches and they would use cloaks to say, this is the king. And Jesus was actually answering a prophetic word from Isaiah that said, your king will come on an unridden donkey, a colt. And they were celebrating that moment. 
And what I found was fascinating this morning, and David and Nicola didn't know I was going to do this. Uh, David said to me, he said, I've got a video of my daughter Alice's wedding from last weekend. So remember that um, uh, their daughter Alice got married last weekend. And David said, show, I want to show you this video. And it was the video of, of the, the, the married couple, newly married couple, coming to the reception. And what happens when the newly married couple come into reception? They all stand. And they, all, uh, and they have this standing ovation. And, and I was going to say that, but now I've got a real-life example. I won't show you the video. But Alice uh, is walking, looking beautiful. And, and David is making an effort there, is booging along. I saw that. Um, but everyone's standing and applauding the newly married couple, Sam and Alice, going, wow, you guys, we want to celebrate you because you're worthy of our attention. And that's what Palm Sunday is all about. It's about declaring that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, and he's worthy of our praise. And we want to say, Hosanna, welcome to the King of Kings. So can I invite you, and you're not doing this to me or to the worship team, can I invite you to stand, and can we welcome in the King of Kings to our Palm Sunday service with a standing ovation, applauding the King of Kings. Let's worship him. Amen.
Let's sing out our praise. Let's lay down our palms. Let's lift up our praise to the only one worthy. To the only one worthy. Oh, we welcome you here. Come have your way. We welcome you here. Oh, come have your way. Let's lay down our clothes. Let's lay down our knees. Let's welcome him in, the only one worthy. Let's lay down our clothes. Let's lay down our leaves. Let's make him away, the only one worthy. The only one worthy. The only one worthy, the only one streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when i'm found in the desert place the walk through the wilderness blessed be your name hey for every blessing you pour out i'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in lord still i will say oh, blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glory be your name on the road marked with suffering the pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out on turn back to praise when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, oh, blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out on, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes. 
is easy, Lord. Still I will say, Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious
Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Let's lift up our hallelujahs, shall we? Let's lift up our praise. The same king that entered Jerusalem 2,000 years ago shakes the earth, calls on every generation to declare that I am the Lord of all, not just of a historical day, not just a story from our past, but from a now, a God that cares about every moment, every being, every, every child, from the youngest to the oldest. Let's just declare... The King of Kings, let's take some time to worship him, to celebrate him and declare that he is our God. He's not just a story figure. Thank you, Jesus, for this day, Palm Sunday, where we start to prepare ourselves or continue to prepare ourselves for what is to come. That as we remember you coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, yes, the crowds were celebrated. We know there was something else was going to happen. But today, Lord, we want to declare how wonderful we think you are, that you're worthy of praise and adoration. Thank you that you have cleared the way. You've made access to your Father God through what you did on the cross. And we want to be people that learn to celebrate well and to be thankful for what you've done for us. May we live as grateful people. That verse there, that song we just sang of people of selfless faith that point towards Jesus, not towards ourselves. God, your name is above every name. We worship you. Amen. Amen. Do take your seats. Thank you, worship team. I'll just remind as we were worshiping this morning that at the end of Mark 11, where we hear the story of Palm Sunday, Jesus goes on from there, and we don't tend to talk about this in Palm Sunday. It's an awkward part of the Bible where Jesus goes from there, and he goes to the temple, and he clears the temple of all the people that are limiting access to the throne room, to the Holy of Holies, a place that was segregated where women couldn't get in, where disabled couldn't get in, where children couldn't get in. And I love the fact today that we are a church where everyone is welcome, where everyone can be part of this thing we call church this is God's family and from the youngest to the oldest whatever your story you're welcome here because Jesus created space for each one of us so welcome to you um, if you've never been here to Freedom Church before you're really welcome if it's your it's something you do every weekend thank you for coming and being committed to this church family it's so good to be together and spend time with each other in a moment we're going to release the children to their groups but I'm looking for any family news Crouches, you can come first. Yes, I've prepped them up. It's okay. Some of you are aware that last week, um, just we were finishing church last week, our good friend Reuben here decided that he hadn't finished for the day and he had a bit of a moment, shall we say, and ambulances were called and doctors who fortunately, we've got lots of doctors in the house. Massive thanks to John and Anna Hughes and to Leslie who were so helpful uh, last week. But um, for those of you who were a bit aware that something was going on, as you can see, <laughs> Fully healthy and restored and wriggly as normal. Uh, but Joe and Lauren, I know it's for you, it was quite a traumatic time last weekend. Tell us a bit about that for those, because we're family, we care. Um, who would like to? <laughs> um, so can you just watch him? Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so he was, um, he was having some, uh, some seizures, I th we think. Um, this happened actually almost kind of you know, a couple of months ago as well. 
um, at church on a Sunday as well. So we might not come back again. We don't know. Um, but um, yeah, so then we, yeah, he was taken away. Um, he had a CT scan on his head and a um, an EEG, which is like he, which way he scanned their brain waves, and there was nothing, nothing um, there as well. So we don't really know. They can't really say what caused it. Um, but we do have some emergency medication now, so if it does happen again, then we're a little bit more prepared. But um, yeah, it was a bit of a struggle in the ward keeping him entertained. But um, we were uh, we were in a really fancy new ward, so there was pull down beds as well, so we could try and sleep next to him if he did sleep. But um, he did not. But um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was um, yeah. We're very thankful for everyone who um, uh, who helped as well. But um, yeah, he's fine. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. let's continue praying for Joe, for Lorna, and for Reuben. Um, you know, last week uh, Deb spoke on intercession, and we were there. Lottie and I were there. We're praying, and people gathering around. And I know there's a group of people at the back just interceding on behalf of Reuben. And um, it, I love our church family. I love that everyone plays their part in different ways. And so thank you to those who are, who are involved in that. I know it's quite a challenging sort of end of church last Sunday, uh, but God is good. And do keep praying because they don't know exactly what's caused this. It's happened twice now. And I know that as parents, they would love to know what is the reason behind this. They've got some medication, but what's really going on? So they've got further things to, to work out there. Any other less traumatic family <laughs> news or less, maybe a bit less extreme? Um, anyone has got any family news stories? Yes. For a, for a change. Um, well, on Friday, I just suddenly caught a vomit bug out of nowhere. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. No, I am not... Actually, don't share. You're not done. You're not done. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there was something I was really looking forward to on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so I was really upset because um, I thought I was going to miss it, but I felt... Like the Lord just healed me because I healed very, very quickly. Oh, there we go. Well said. Fantastic. Turn that one round. At the back. Hi, I'm Trish and my husband here is Richard. And we've been worshipping here since October, expecting to move any week. Um, and the house we were expecting to move to in Milton Keynes has just fallen through. So we may be with you a lot longer. But we'd appreciate your prayers that we do find the right house adapted for a wheelchair with a wet room. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. We love having you and Richard here. And uh, I know that's not what you wanted to hear. But weirdly, it's a blessing for us. So good to have you with us. Wonderful. Yes. My mum's got a birthday tomorrow. How old is she? 32. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Happy birthday, Diana, for tomorrow. <laughs> she looks so excited about it. <laughs> a bit outed publicly. Right, anyone else? Uh, got time for one more, I think. Ooh. No? Just stretching her hair. Wonderful. Good. Well, it's good to hear what God's doing amongst us. I love the stories of both faith and fun. And that is family, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's messy. Somebody once said, it was my brother-in-law used to always say, he says, it's nice and tidy in the graveyard, but it's messy in the nursery, but that's where the life is. We don't want to end up with a church that looks like a graveyard where it's all very ordered and there's no life. We want a bit of fun. We want a little bit of mess. It's okay. It's safe. It's God's family. We're in good hands. So boys and girls and young people, uh, you're out with Joe and Izzy and team and young people out with Zoe and team. And for the rest of us, before we um, go into the next part of our morning, uh, have a look at the screens and we're sharing with you our freedom news for today. On Friday, the 29th of March, we're having our Good Friday Family Fun Celebration, a morning of fun crafts and Easter activities for Freedom Kids and their families from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. at the Freedom Centre. Please sign up via Church Suite. Also, on the 31st of March, we will be having our Easter Sunday service from 10 a.m. at the Romsey School. It's going to be an all-age service celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Come on! 
We've got a newcomer's lunch at the Freedom Centre coming up on Sunday the 14th of April. So if you're new to Freedom Church or have been around for a little while and missed previous ones, I would love to see you there. It's a great opportunity to get to meet some other new folks as well as some of the staff team, leadership team and trustees over a nice lunch. We'll share some information with you about the culture of Freedom Church as well as some helpful ways that you can get involved in the life of the church. So please, come and join us at the Freedom Centre at 12 o'clock on the 14th of April. If you would like to come along, please sign up via Church Suite. And if you don't have Church Suite yet, come and talk to me or send me an email. I'll make sure there's some food for you there. Be great to see you. Hi, I'm Amanda Jones. As you'll probably know, Helen Hull and I are hosting a weekend retreat, May the 3rd to the 5th, for about 15 to 20 men and women at the Greenhouse Christian Hotel in Poole. This is a quick reminder, there's only a few ensuite rooms left, so you may want to get on Church Suite to book. It's a beautiful location with outdoor heated pool and only a 15 minute walk to the gorgeous Branksome Chime Beach. There's going to be daily opportunity for prayer and worship, plus lots of free time to relax with friends and God. We look forward to seeing you there. Bye. And you can use the QR code there if you want to give towards the church or there's a giving station outside. Uh, we really do appreciate all those that give generously toward the work of Freedom Church. And there's lots of things going on. There's this uh, weekend retreat you can go to. There's also um, a weekend, church weekend away, which next weekend is the end of the early bird offer. So you want to get your tickets? This next week is definitely when you want to get them in the next few days. Um, Bryony, why don't you come and join me? Uh, Rob's going to speak in just a moment. Uh, but we're just asking different people to come and share some of their prayer stories. We're talking about prayer in this last season. And um, Bryony is part of uh, the same bread group that, um, that Wonder is part of, along with Elaine. And uh, they, been, they actually did this book, um, which we've been exploring, of praying like monks, living like fools, before Christmas. And um, I just said, we'd love to hear some of your story. We'd love to hear um, some of your experience of prayer. So that one's yours. So for those who don't know who you are, Bryony, just mm -hmm. give a little bit of, yeah, just, just a sentence. Just a sentence. So... Um, I've been coming to this church for a, a long time. I'm not going to say how many years because it's too many. <laughs> but my husband, Stuart, is the son of the pastor, Pete Light, that used to run the church here. So I've been coming for a long time. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. And you've got children, you've got two yes, I have, men. I have two, yes, <laughs> two big boys, 21 and soon to be 20. And then my daughter, Amy, who is 14. Yeah, Isaac and Joe. Yeah. And then, so you've been doing this, this bread group along with others, and before Christmas, you covered this book. And for you, I know that was significant, and we've talked about some of this, yeah. um, about how you prayed, and you spent years praying and going, this just helped you in a different way. Can you tell us yeah. a bit about that experience? Yeah. So, y you know, when you read a book, and after you've finished reading it, you're like, oh, that's a good book. I enjoyed that. That was interesting. You don't often, like, remember the specifics. So I thought I would prepare for this little session without rereading it as much as I wanted to reread it because I thought, well, let's see what actually stuck. And um, I have a few thoughts, if that's okay. I'll just, just, <laughs> just so I don't lose my way. Um, but, yeah, um, that I, I didn't really enjoy the book, actually. <laughs> That was not the first line I thought you'd say. Okay. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, yeah, no, she does. <laughs> it was transformational. Um, I don't think there's many books that I would say that about. Um, Captivating by Stacey Eldridge is one, and this is another one. Um, so I really recommend it. It totally reframed my perception of prayer and my approach to prayer, my prayer life, my relationship with God. Absolutely. Some of the concepts really blew my mind. Um, and I was like, as I was reading, I had to sit back and stop reading. I was like, whoa, what, what was that again? Um, and it was like a, like a new neural pathway had opened up in my brain. And I was like, that is a completely different way of thinking about prayer um, that is transformational. 
I'd always thought of um, prayer, sort of words like dry, dusty, boring, prayer meetings, possibly fall asleep, disappointing. Um, now when I think about prayer, the words are vibrant, energy, um, I can't remember the words, um, relationship, exciting, urgent, transcend transcendent, yeah. um, mystery, joy, peace, a lot of really positive words. Um, and that has been my experience of prayer going forward. Oh, voice is going. Yeah, so I think Tyler Statton, um, he's he's not one of those, uh, you know, as an author of prayer, you'd think he might be really, you know, he's got it nailed, he's got everything sorted. Um, somebody unattainable that has this amazing prayer life. Um, and he's not like that. He's authentic, he's honest. He has skeletons in the closet, which he lets, that he lets fall out. Um and he's very vulnerable, um, and he's a little bit judgmental as well, and he shares all that with you. <laughs> he's really honest about it, and so then when he takes you on a journey of understanding prayer, you can relate to him, and you understand that. So I really liked it. Um, you can tell that he's a, a faithful servant of God that's been walking through a journey with God, and prayer is the heart of that. <coughs> you okay? Yeah. Against the water? Yeah. No, um, no, it's all good. Um, so, what concepts stuck with me? Um, there's two really that have totally changed how I pray. Um, the first is, as Judith shared, um, thinking about God and how glorious and how majestic and amazing he is, putting him first. And then. Yeah, so giving God the glory, sorry. <laughs> and then moving on to what I want to pray about. But then the key is trusting God. Not just faith in God, but trusting God for the outcome. So God's will, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So every time I pray now, I come, I give, I thank God for who he is. I move into my prayer and then... I just have to hand over to him and say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm giving, I'm doing my bit, I'm partnering with him, and then I leave it with God. And that takes all the pressure off me, because it's over to him, and I have to trust him for the outcome, whatever that is. So that's been a really big thing. And the second thing is that God receives and really cares about every single prayer. Every tear that we cry, he receives that in his golden bowls. He doesn't just receive it and hear it. He takes that and he uses that to build his kingdom with it's part of his redemptive plan for the for a new heaven and a new earth. That blew my mind. Like we're not just praying to kind of get our lives sorted out here on earth. We're praying as part of God's oh thank you. We're praying because God needs us to pray for a future, for the future of this planet, for the future of of humanity. Would you say then, having spent the time as, as, as a group, going through the book, having read it yourself and you're saying things, do you think this has changed like, the way you prayed? Or was it just your, your prayer life was just got a bit stuck and it's all rejuvenated? I think, yeah, it's changed. It's given me an insight into what my relationship with God needs to be like because he wants to use us to pray for the 
for future generations. And, uh, yeah, I think I didn't really get it before, but I, I get it now. Like, we strap on our armour and we're fighting the good fight of faith. And, um, yeah, so, I, you know, I prayed before, but it wasn't as vital. It wasn't as... There wasn't the connection with God that, that, that I have now. I hear, I hear God's voice a lot more because I trust him more. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Bryony. Any okay. last thoughts before... Uh, are we going to give some space for Rob in just a moment? Um, I think the only other thing is that sometimes when you pray, you're raging against injustice or you're raging against a situation that you don't like. Um, but... We have to trust God, and we have to. We pray our prayers, but we say, "Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven," and then we let it go. And rather than raging against God, we give it. So it was just such an amazing book. I want to reread it again. Um, so yeah, so I really recommend. Thank you, Bryony. Um, I've been rereading the book. I read it every week when the chapter's on. So I read the chapter. So I read this morning what we've been speaking about, about daily bread. And, and, it, and it is just something very useful, I think, what we've been learning. And there's so much in all of this. And I know, you know, this is just a book. Let's be honest, just a person writing a book. Yeah. But it's just someone who asks the questions in a different way, like you say, reframes and asks different questions. You demystifies or destigmatize the way you're meant to pray and just and allows it almost a mystery to remain while we just pray, mm. which is a normal, everyday conversation. Yeah. So we don't, I, I'm aware Rob's got stuff planned and, and he's been okay. preparing hard this week. Yeah. So I don't want to take good. away from it, but Bryony, thank you so much for you brought no. today. Thank you for your heart of prayer. Thank you for the way you've got stuck into prayer once again. And, and I love the fact, you know, that simple thing, you're praying now and you're trusting, saying, God, your will be done, uh, not mine. And so I think that's a very brave prayer, but it is how Jesus taught us to pray. It's so what he you. prayed on the cross. Absolutely, so, yeah. yes. Yeah, thank you very Great. much. Should we show our appreciation for Bryony bringing her thoughts today? <laughs> Rob. Come and join me. So Rob is part of our leadership team, and uh, Rob has been preparing extra hard this week. Extra, extra hard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I said to him, I found out that Rob had been up a lot in the night preparing this talk. And I said to him, semi-joking, this better be good, because he put a lot of hours in. So can I just encourage you? to make sure that you appreciate what Rob has put in because Rob works full-time. This is something he's had to put in in his spare time. And I know you really care passionately about bringing the Word of God to us as a church community. You did a brilliant job when I was away in my sabbatical. I did catch up and watch them all, don't worry. And not just yours, everyone's. But I, I just value your heart. You love the Word of God and how you bring and apply the Word of God to our everyday life. And so um, let me just pray for Rob because I think when you're communicating in this way, uh, we, we do believe that God speaks through people. And that I want to pray that, yes, Rob's prepared a whole bunch of stuff. But I want to pray that God speaks through Rob, that he brings to life his words. And um, maybe those words that you picked up at 3 o'clock in the morning are going to be full of the Holy Spirit. Because it, your, your weakness, God's strength. Let's pray a blessing upon you. Look, I thank you uh, for Rob. I thank you for his uh, commitment to studying and exploring the Word of God. Thank you. Your, your Holy Spirit breathes through ancient scriptures, that they are as relevant today as they were when they were written. And I pray that as, as Rob brings to us this next installment around prayer, how we pray like monks and live like fools, and we understand what daily bread really means, Lord, would you use his words? Would you, your voice come through him, we pray. Amen. Um, firstly, thank you to Bryony. I think um, what she said and the power of what she said kind of partners with what I'm going to say now um, so much. So hopefully you, you will get the message as it comes through. God's working in this. Um, before you get too comfortable, um, I want to ask you this question, okay? So I'm going to have five, oh no, seven maybe prayers that are going to come up. And I want you to think, which of these do you pray the most often? So the first prayer is, Lord, just give me strength to face the day. Or, I lift up my government and the decisions they make. Or, Lord, look after my children. Or, Jesus, meet my work colleague and help me bring them to you. Or, Lord, bring peace to Gaza. Or, Lord, help my friend who is going through a tough time. 
or, or God, I need a car parking space now, you know I'm late. Okay, so I'm going to give you 15 seconds to think, what is the prayer that you pray most often? And if you're sat next to someone and brave enough to tell them, then go and do that. Okay, what is the kind of prayer that you pray the most often? And my next question is, which of these prayers do you think is the most important? Which of those do you think is the most important? Have a little think about that. Which one do you think is the most important? And maybe share that with the person next to you. And then the obvious question is, are they the same thing? Maybe. Maybe not. The the thing is, when... um, when the disciples asked Jesus, um, said to him, how do we pray? It's not, and it's been said before, it's not that they didn't know how to pray. They knew how to pray. They prayed three times a day. They had a structure. But they saw Jesus pray in a completely different way. And so they wanted to know, you pray like this, and I'm following you. How do I pray? And the verses we're focusing on today are this. It starts with, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And the shocking thing is that we're praying massive prayers. Your kingdom come. The reign of God over the earth. Huge prayers. Things that are beyond our imagination in some form. But we're also praying for the basic thing. Our bread. Our next meal. The huge and the small. And so what we're encouraged to do is to pray this huge scope of things. And this is not a case of, I'm just adding to your prayer load. This is an invitation to pray for the big and the small. And as I was reflecting on this, and I was reflecting on my own prayer life, I was thinking, why have I not necessarily got this? What what, what are different times in my life when my prayer life has been good and my prayer life hasn't been so good? What are the things that are holding me back? from really appreciating this. These new neural pathways, as was discussed, that I have it set in my mind, what God is trying to tell me. And there were three questions, I think, that I used as excuses. And these three questions all start with why. And I think why is really important. I think it's Simon Sinek who says, start with the why, and the what and the how will follow. If we understand, if we have our, the right picture in our heart, why we're doing this, then actually out of those things will meaningful action come. If we try and do the action without the why, then it it, it won't work. And so all of these start with why. And they are in the negative to begin with, but what I hope is by the end of this talk that you will see them in the positive, that you will build the right picture of why we ask. So the first one is, why ask for the big and the small? Why do we need to do both? Second is, Why ask when he already knows what we need? And the third is, why ask when he'll do what he wants to do anyway? Maybe I'm the only person who's thought that. But, you know, why, why do these things when he is God and I'm not? So the first one is, why ask for the big and the small things? Now, I'm quite a... A confident guy and a reasonably competent guy. You know, I, I, I take big, a lot of pride in the things that I achieve. This is a part of who I am. I like to, to get things done. I like to do things. And I step out with them. It's part of my personality. And maybe you're not like that. But I think all of us like to feel that we have some kind of control. Or at least all of us don't like to be out of control. But there are some things, however confident or arrogant you might think, or however I am, that I know I can't control. That I can't control my salvation. I'm not good enough to get into heaven. So I give that to God. That's God's. I'm pretty good at things, but I can't solve the uh, Middle East um, peace crisis. I can't do that. So I pray about that. I give that to God. These big things that I can't control, I am more than happy to give to God. But the things that are close to me, um, that I can control, I gather to myself. My work, I work really hard, and I make sure that I do a good job. My family, I work, um, I kind of, um, I try and dislive in my children and guide them. I try and build these kind of things. I work and I work. The things that I um, I can do, I work really hard and I try and control them. And And I think I'm doing a good job, and I'm building up on these things. 
And then, and some of you may have witnessed this, when during um, October, November, where I'd taken on things within the church, my job was becoming more and more tense, and, and my family was still, <laughs> still had it and was going on, I just collapsed. Absolutely collapsed. I had burdened myself. I'd taken all of these things. And then it became infinitely obvious that I wasn't in control. And I think so much, so we try and do this over and over and over again. And I go back to it again. Even though I had that experience, I'll go back and think that I can handle my daily bread. I can sort this out. Um, Tyler Statton um, uses this phrase, we are waging war against control. We pray for the big and the small things because it's a way of us saying, I'm not in control. You are. And this is not just true of me, it is true of society. We are in a blessed country. We are in a country that has more control than we've ever had before. We are, more, we are socially minded. We are trying to solve the world's problems. And we have the resources on the whole to do it. We can, we, um, we're not worried about what we're going to eat next. We're not worried, um, we are able to feel like we can have control. And yet, we are the most anxious generation there has been. We feel the pressure of all these things going on. And this is the story that came from the Garden of Eden, where we said, um, we, know what, we want to know what is right and wrong. We are going to have control of that. And then when we said that, all of a sudden we realized we were naked. We realized that we, um, that we weren't enough to do that. That we were burdened and we were, had that anxiety on us. We feel like we have the weight of the world on our shoulders, but we were never meant to feel like that. The, um, um, the, the world is in God's hands. The other reason that we, um, we pray about the big and the small things is because um, when we give everything to God, then we start to see the blessings that he has given in our life. That car parking space um, that suddenly appears isn't just luck, but is a gift from God. Um, we live in... Well, I just lost my space. One moment. Um, one more. Oh, yeah. We live in gratitude. When we lay everything down we, we are, um, and, say, and give everything to God, when it comes back to us as a blessing, we live in gratitude and praising him and worshipping him. And this is exactly what we're called to be, worshipful people. And therefore, um, when we give it all to him, and we realize everything he's giving back to us, then we start to relax. We start to feel fulfilled. We start, our anxiety seeps away because we have given it to him, and we trust him, and we become grateful, praiseworthy people who focus on him. It is well known that writing down three things at the end of your day, if you're anxious about things that you are thankful for, has a big impact on our heart. But what if we gave it all to him at the beginning and we're thankful at the end? Then we complete that circle of being in relationship with God and trusting in him. And I've got to say, I've recently found this. Um, I, um, I get to walk to school, and, but sometimes I drive, even though it's five minutes away. And um, I, I felt a really call from God saying, start walking to school even when it's raining. And just spend that time in the morning. And I've been doing it, giving every little thing, every conversation I know is coming, those children who I know are going through a tough time, those, um, anything that's stressed, just giving it to him on the way in. And on the way back, I get to say thank you and thank you and thank you. And when I get home, that weight isn't on me anymore. I get to focus on my family because I've given everything to him, and I've been grateful on the way back, and it is life-changing. So why do we give the big and the small things? Because that's what we were always meant to do. We were never meant to carry it. We were meant to be grateful people, praising him, and knowing how he blesses us all the time. So why ask when he knows what we need? There is... Um, a passage in John 5, and it's um, about a healing pool. And um, the, this pool was um, always surrounded by people who were ill and disabled. And um, the story went that as it kind of the bubbles came up, 
that if they jumped in and got those first bubbles, that they would be healed. And then Jesus comes along and says to, um, to someone, um, what do, why are you here? What do you want? We think, isn't it obvious? You know, I'm disabled, I'm next to a pool, and I'm trying to get that first bubble. Isn't it obvious what I want? You're the healer. And but the contrast that is going on here is that you've got an impersonal um, kind of pool that is just throwing, thing, um, throwing up bubbles that may heal. And you have a personal Jesus who wants to have a conversation with you. And I think sometimes we can do that. We can treat God as this impersonal force that you think, if I hang around church a bit, then maybe the bubbles will hit me and I may get some blessing. That actually we don't actually see him as a human, well, was a human and is God and who's personal, who wants to have a relationship with us. Or maybe we do, to a certain extent, ask him, but we treat him something like a vending machine where we punch our buttons and we wait for what we th- think should arrive and sometimes it gets stuck on the way and we shake it and then we receive, um, then we receive something. And if it goes wrong and you talk to the owner of the shop, they say it's not really our vending machine, you have to talk to someone else. But it's, just an, it's, just an, it's, just a, it's just a box that you get something out of. Or maybe you do ask and you treat um, God like Amazon and you put your order in and you give it two stars because there was a bit, a bit of a delay and it wasn't exactly what you expected when it arrived. But this impersonal far off, like we treat God, um, um, kind of that we're the customer and that he owes us something. But that's not how Jesus wants us to behave. That's not what he's called us into. He asks, he wants to have a conversation. He wants to ask us. You see, God wants partners and children and not customers. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't get to kind of like feel a little bit wronged or upset. You know, we all know that our children will complain to their parents when things aren't as they expect. But that is not done in a, rev- in a little spiteful review. That is done in a relationship. As we sit, um, with, um, as parents sit with their children and explain and hold them when things haven't gone right, when they don't understand. And that is part of the richness of a relationship. Quite often um, when I get home, so, um, I'll get home from work and I'm a little bit frazzled. And um, the plan is always to sit in front of the television and try and decompress. And um, Sarah will ask, what program do you want to watch tonight? And me being a great guy, think to myself, I'll do her a favor here. I'll say, I don't care, whatever you decide. And yet she still seems a little bit upset by that. And I have no idea why. No idea why. What have I done wrong? Because I've been a great guy obviously. And then, um, but then it starts to dawn on me um, that actually what she wasn't after was what pro- program do we want to w- watch tonight, because maybe she's already made her mind up anyway, but <laughs> what she wanted was to engage in a conversation. What she wanted was to get a sense of how I was feeling that day, what kind of, what of mood was I in. She wanted to know if I'd heard of any programs or anything that I was looking forward to watch. She wanted to engage with me and have a conversation. And so I think think we're challenged to change the way that we approach God when we ask. Yes, it's about wanting stuff, but really it's, um, it's not about just asking, it's about building that relationship and getting to understand each other so that we can understand God's desires and that we can know that he understands our desires. That is a relationship that's being built. And therefore, the things, the products that come back, don't become irrelevant by any shape shape of imagination, but they become within the context of a relationship, which is far more important. And the third question. Why ask when he'll do what he wants anyway? You see, God is good, and I'm not. I'm not. God sees all things, and I've just got my human eyes that just look around, and I have a certain bias that even goes on those. God has a plan for all humanity, and I have no idea what I'm even doing tomorrow. So understandably, it's easy to surmise that asking is only about being molded by what he already um, wants, his will, and uh, and his understanding. But he doesn't really listen or take our requests on board 
that is just about us aligning ourselves to him. And without doubt, that is part of the process. There's, um, that is one of the great things about being in a relationship with God, is that you are molded by being with him, that you do start to see things from his perspective and not yours. But in a mystery, that's not where it ends. In Exodus 32, um, the, uh, Moses, God and Moses have taken the Israelites out of Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've seen pillars of fire. They've been fed with manna and quails. They've had water when they've needed it. They've defeated their enemies. And then Moses at the top of the hill, and they decide that, they're, they're, that all of this is complete rubbish. They're grumbling, and they, and they start making a golden calf. They turn their back on God. And um, they're very ungrateful. And God is absolutely livid with this. He says, I can't believe that they're doing this. I'm going to wipe them out. <coughs> and then Moses appeals to him. He has a request. And he says, turn your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore and by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. The word relented there is the same word that's used for repent. And sometimes we have this idea of repent just means that you've done something wrong and therefore you need to do, do something right. But um, repent means that you're going to change your mind. You change your mind. And this God here changed his mind. And that's a little bit uncomfortable, isn't it, really? Sometimes we think, well, surely God's kind of, him being the rock is, is the security. But actually... God, um, Moses here was new God. From his relationship, he knew God. And as he, um, as he spoke to him and appealed to the fact that he really knew him, that God listened to his child and changed his mind. And this is a mystery because, you know, in other places, in Malachi, for example, it says, I am the Lord that do not change. So you're kind of like, what is going on here? And I think there is, there is some, there is some, when we think of God, maybe we think of God as like a robot. You put an input in and you get the standard input out, you know, output out. And therefore there is no, um, you can't kind of manipulate that. There is no change within that. It's just bang, 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 and this is what you get. And we forget that God is not a robot, but he is, he is an emotional being. He is someone who brings, has connection with us. And he has chosen to empower us. And it does seem that where, in part of all of this, he does change his plans. There is the story of the Roman centurion who goes to Jesus and says, um, I know what it is to, um, to command armies, and I know that if you say the word, um, my daughter will be healed. And he says, because of your faith, she is healed. Because you've done that, I'm going to do this. In James it says, you do not have because you do not ask. Because you ask, you will have them, because you don't, you do it. There is a power that comes through our asking, through our prayers, that we are, as, as Bryony was saying, we are an important part of this process, that he has empowered us to do these things. Um, my son Henry, um, he, both our boys are not the kind of boys to sit down and do crafts at any point during the day. They are constantly running, constantly on the go, always doing that, until it comes to about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the evening when they should be going to bed. At this point, they must do a craft activity. And so they are, they're planning and they're drawing and they're doing all of these things just when we're trying to get into the bed. And, oh, it's just agony. And a little while ago, um, we heard this little pitter-patter as they ran, he ran past the living room and into the kitchen and went out. And there was Henry with the scissors. Oh, he's on the telephone. Going to get the scissors without our permission is a, is a no-no. Uh, especially at 8 o'clock at night. And I gave him a good turning off. And then a few weeks later, we heard this piece of pattern about it. He was running down. And then a knock on the door. And Henry said, Dad, I know what you're going to say, but please can I have the scissors? Oh, my heart melted. <laughs> because, because, because he knew me. He knew what was right and wrong. He came to speak to me. 
And he knew what, what, what I might say, but he still wanted to ask. And so what do I say? Okay, so what is it that you need to do? And he's like, I just need to cut this bit. Okay, fantastic. Let's go. Let's cut this thing out. Now let's get into bed. And I think this is a little bit of a window into how God wants to deal with us. He loves it when we, when we know him, when we come to him, even with things that are, well, things that are important to us. But maybe, you know, um, well, they're important to him, but maybe you, you're kind of like, you're wondering, you're wondering, is God going to answer this prayer? He still loves it, and he wants to meet us in that place. So I suppose my question is this. Um, as we kind of consider all of these things, what is your why? What is it that is driving you to ask? What is the picture that you have of God? Do you have a picture of a God that is distant, that he handles the big things, the supernatural things, and you handle the small things, your life? He handles the kingdom come, and you handle the daily bread. Well, I challenge you to repent. Not because that you, you know, not as a, you've been a naughty boy or girl, but repent and change your mind. I challenge you to, to kind of to say, I'm going to choose to give him everything because that is how I've been designed to be. Not to take on um, the burden of the world, but to, to worship him, to be grateful for him, to see his blessings, to see the world as it is. This is an opportunity when you ask for the big and small things to see how God sees the world, to give him, to live in the blessings that he has given us. Actually, we're coming towards the end. So if the band can start coming up, that would be great. Secondly, do you picture God as an impersonal bubbling pool? Or like an Amazon order, where you order and then it, it just arrives? Maybe if you do that, then I invite you to repent, to change your mind. And to start a relationship with God, the one above all things, who has invited you into relationship with him where you start to value and understand the relationship more than maybe even the things that come, but you start to understand him, and you know that he understands you. Do you have a picture of God as a robot who pretends to listen but is going to do his own, own thing anyway? If you do, I challenge you to repent and change your mind. And know that none of this is true, that your asking is key to bringing the kingdom, that he is emotionally moved like a father when you ask and he is, empowers you. You're making a choice now as part of the change, but the Holy Spirit, and I'll pray in a moment, the Holy Spirit will come and he will work that in your heart. And part of the action that I challenge you to go forward with in this reflective time as you go forward during this week is this. I challenge you to ask boldly. To ask about those small things that you have been handling yourself. To ask for those things that force you into a discussion and a relationship with him and to go deeper with him. To ask for something that you think maybe he might even say no to but see the good things that he may give out of that. There, there is, um, when Jesus continues to talk about asking, he talks about um, um, a father is, um, and a son, and he says, um, does a f uh, when, a, when a son asks for something, bread, um, does the father give a stone or a snake? How much more so than will your father in heaven, who is good, will give you good things? And I want, to, I want us to live in this picture of a heavenly father who loves you, who wants a relationship with you, who wants you to bring everything to him so that you can live a fullness of life. Um, so I just want to pray, and if the band could start to, to play, it would be fantastic. That if, if you've been challenged this morning, if you have been challenged that actually maybe your picture of God isn't the right picture, that actually your whys have stopped you from praying, when actually the whys should be um, bringing you closer to be ask more, and you want that, 
and you want that deep why in your heart so that you can go out and live in this promise that has been given to us. Live in the way that Jesus has taught us to pray. Then now let me just pray for you now and you continue that prayer in your heart as we go into to worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for inviting us to pray to you, to ask to you in a way that is a father and a child and is as a partner. Lord, I pray that um, the Holy Spirit comes into each person here this morning. That they, they, the things that are holding them back, the things, those neural pathways that haven't yet been formed, that you, um, you come in and the Holy Spirit work on our hearts, work on our heads to see um, to see the way that you are, the relationship that you want us to have um, with you. That we will change, turn away from those negative things that, that turn you, the personal God, into the impersonal. That you take away that fear of, of if we actually open ourselves up to you and that we actually get, show you our desires, that actually that you will, um, the fear that you won't respond fear that you, you won't love us the same way, but actually that you will be there with us, that you feel, have complete joy in that. Lord, I pray for people who've been, um, who've been carrying so much, those everyday things, and the anxiety has been building. Lord, I pray for a supernatural release from that, that they can give, lay everything at your feet, the big and the small, and trust you in all of those things. Lord, thank you for inviting us to this. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to sit, feel free to stand, whatever you prefer to do, how you'd like to respond.
filled with wonder. bring you our worship, we bring you our praise, our love, we bring you our thankfulness. We are grateful people for all you've given to each one of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have given us this gift of prayer, that we can isn't it amazing? We can communicate with you, with your mighty God, and you care enough to listen. And more than that, you respond. You're interested in our, our desires, our needs, our frustrations, our everyday, and you're also interested in the big and the global. And you can manage it all. None of it's too much for you. May we never take that connection for granted. You care about every breath, every dilemma, every day. You're interested. Thank you, Father God. Thank you so much, Rob, for bringing us the latest to remind us that God cares about our daily bread and about worldwide challenges that we're facing. And I thought what you shared there about how you walk to work and walk home again, I think that's probably a good challenge for many of us to go, can we start our day bringing what we've got ahead to God and on the way back at the end of our day, the examine some people would refer to it as that kind of process of reflecting on our day and saying, God, thank you for what you've brought me through. And to have that kind of cyclical conversation with God. God cares about every moment of our day. And our prayer life should never be restricted to a few minutes slotted in between whatever it is you do in your start to your day. But something that goes throughout our day. So thank you, Rob, for bringing more to us to ponder, to think. Thank you for all the time you spent putting that together. Thank you, worship team, for leading us so well. 
as always. And thank you for being here this morning. Um, God bless you as you go from here. Uh, may you know that his love for you, he cares about you, he cares deeply about you, your family and your fears. And as you go from here, where you know God being with you and his peace, the pastoral understanding is always present. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday, Easter Sunday, here at 10 o'clock. And we look forward to joining us together then.